what would you pay to see the grandeur of the lower falls of the Yellowstone, the otherworldliness of the geysers and thermal features, or the paint palette colors of grand prismatic springs, or to see a grizzly bear or a wolf in the wild? Well, the answer is apparently not much. Conservation at its core is about taking care of the thing that you already own. When it comes to public lands, America's best idea has become something of an afterthought. In 2016, we spent a lot of time, energy, and money marketing U.S. national parks globally through the Find Your Park campaign. And visitation grew from 280 million to 330 million in five years. You put a million more visitors per year in this park, what does that mean for trash removal? How many more times do you have to clean the bathroom? How many more emergency medical service calls or law enforcement calls? The infrastructure problems the parks experience are staggering at this point. And the deferred maintenance problem in our national parks is routine maintenance that doesn't get addressed, that just accumulates year after year, so it becomes deferred maintenance. That price tag was $5 billion in 1997. You fast forward here to 2021, and it's $12 billion. If you've gone through Fort Yellowstone, you've seen a, a fairly wide range of deterioration of Fort Yellowstone assets. And these are some of the most historic structures in the National Park Service. Uh, the assets are too important and too core to our mission to let them deteriorate. You need quality housing if you want to recruit good people to do those jobs. We want the best of the best in Yellowstone, and the best of the best aren't gonna come and live in 1960s trailers. There's environmental consequences of deferred maintenance as well. There's so much infrastructure that supports conservation. There are trails, boardwalks, and paths. Boardwalks are a good example of how we protect geologic resources and still provide visitor access to those resources. You know, we've got about $7 million in need just in boardwalk replacements alone. Wastewater treatment facilities and water treatment plants aren't flashy, but essential for us to run the park and host visitation. And if wastewater systems fail, we fail the rivers and streams coming out of these national parks. We fail the wildlife, fish, and other species that rely on those rivers and streams. The continued impacts on infrastructure, on operations, as visitation continues to increase very, very substantially, have got to be addressed and in many ways that's going to take more revenue to do that. Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act and that attempts to take a bite out of the deferred maintenance backlog that we're experiencing. It provides $9.5 billion over five years to start to bring down a backlog of $20 billion that's being experienced by all of our public land units. The challenge is that only gets to half of the problem. You still have another $10 billion plus in deferred maintenance, not to mention routine maintenance that you've got to pay for too. Historically, the park has relied on user fees, but those user fees went back to Congress and into the General Treasury, and they could be spent on anything. But that all changed in the early 2000s. There was legislation passed called the Federal Lands Recreation Enhancement Act, and that act enabled the user fees that were collected by the parks to stay in the parks. Up to 80% of those fees could stay in the parks. The importance of retaining entrance fees is absolutely essential. Visitation goes up, that translates to more impact. It also translates to more fee revenue for the park. Generally speaking, budgets have been relatively flat and the entrance fees provide a really good margin of excellence for us. Without those, we would be in big trouble. The political process is the primary way that the parks are funded but a growing way that parks are being funded are user fees and actually relying more on the visitors that use the parks. They're more reliable than the political process, but user fees also get the incentives right. We can't just sit back and hold our hands out. 
we charge by the vehicle, which is $35 per car for a seven day pass. For a family of four, average stay is about 3.2 days. It breaks down to about $2.89 per person per day. A very minuscule amount of their total trip cost. If you travel to Seattle and visit the Space Needle and you're a family of four, you're gonna pay $122. You go to Walt Disney World in Florida, you're gonna spend $110 per person per day. We should look at being more creative with funding mechanisms and looking at different ways to charge users. International visitors being charged more, going to a per person instead of a per car, going to a per day fee instead of a per week fee. All of those things should be on the table to get us in the right place. One way to, to get incentives right is to empower uh, our superintendents to have the flexibility to address the needs with the user fees as they see fit. Setting the level of the fee or using the fee for the activity that they think is appropriate. Users should feel good about user fees because user fees actually stay in the park and they go to fund the very thing that the user's there to see. In a perfect world, Yellowstone National Park would be self-sufficient and self-sustaining as our national parks were originally designed to be. How are we as an organization, as an agency, as a Department of Interior, National Park Service, ensuring that whatever fund sources that we have can be as flexible as possible and apply to the right priorities and preparing for the future? The question is, what would you be willing to pay? 